Okay, so we're about one minute, everyone. Just checking in, Katya. Just checking your audio and video. Um, so perfect. This is it. Okay, great stuff. Thank you, everyone. So we've got just another minute or so, and then we're gonna go live. Any questions from anyone before we go live, or is it all good? Yeah. Uh, Ian, do you need a black box for video playback? Um. Yeah, actually, if you can, Mike, that'll be great. Thank you. And then we'll uh, we'll use that. No problem. Perfect. Okay, excellent. So we'll just add the black box, and then we're going to replace it with Catcho once the video is finished. There. Thank you, everyone. Okay, best of luck. So we got 45 seconds. Let's cue the video in anticipation and then we'll hit the play button once we go live. Thanks all. Nigeria is among the 30 high TB burden countries due to limited access to TB screening and testing services. But with support from USAID, the National TB Program, the Stop TB Partnership and Alliance Stakeholders, Bashir Ahmad, a local radiographer, is able to set up and run systematic rapid screenings in Nigeria's most remote areas. He is on the front line, saving lives, cycling to hard-to-reach communities using the ultra-portable digital X-ray system and computer-aided detection or AI software. It's my responsibility to take the examination in terms of positioning the patient. Then we'll collect his samples. Cut for TB is really helping because Actually, it can detect TB at early stage. That's the first one. And secondly, the heat map can show you the fatches around the chest. If there's any fatches, you'll see it with your eyes. It's my town, my community, my people. So it's a dream. So I want to give back to them by helping them or by doing this work. It's my passion. I want to follow my passion. Hello all, a warm welcome to the first 2024 Delph Imaging webinar. My name is Katya Aini and I'll be your host for today. Last year brought in some great news for all of us. The recent global TB report estimated that in 2022, about 7.5 million individuals were newly diagnosed with TB, which is a record high since the WHO begin, began monitoring TB in 1995. While on one hand, it's a testament to our ability to detect and ensure timely intervention, it also highlights another sobering reality millions more remain undetected and untreated. And according to the global TB report, it's estimated to be 3.1 million. So now more than ever, it's critical to develop and deploy innovative screening solutions that can reach these missing millions. Keeping that in mind, today we'll be discussing innovation in action, accelerating TB screening in low resource settings with digital X-ray and CAD. Next slide, please. Today, my colleague Florent Gates and I will be joined by an esteemed line of speakers from around the world 
who will share their insights on planning and implementing TB screening projects. Next slide, please. Uh, these include Dr. Richard Jones, the Regional Medical Director of International SOS, and Dr. Yaw Adusi Poku, the Program Manager at the National TB Control from Ghana Health Service. Next slide, please. We also have with us Professor Rodney Eldrick, the Senior Research Scholar in the Division of Occupational Medicine Sc uh, School of Public Health, and Dr. Alex Scott, the Research Medical Officer at the Center for Lung Infection and Immunity at the University of Cape Town Lung Institute. Next slide, please. Before we begin, let us note a few instructions. This webinar is being simultaneously interpreted in Arabic, French, Portuguese, Russian, and Spanish. So before we begin, kindly ensure that you're tuned in the right channel. And remember to put your questions in the Q&A section where our team stands ready to address them. Next slide, please. On that note, I would like to invite our business unit director, Florin Geertz. Florin, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Katja Yini, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody, to wherever you're dialing in from. Thanks for making the time for joining our webinar today. As Katja mentioned, the first one, uh, the, the first quarter of this year. Um, I'm mostly interested also, and I think all of us are, in uh, hearing uh, more of our speakers later on, as Katja Yini uh, introduced. I just wanted to have a quick, make a few uh, comments about the new impact report of 2023 that we launched. You can go to the next slide, please. So this is actually the 2023 edition. It's the third edition that we've uh, published, like you can see uh, over here. Um, and my colleagues will later put, I think, a link also in the, the chat so that you can uh, have a look at it yourself. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. I think it's good to know why do we track our impact as an organization in the first place. And it's mainly around three topics, which is transparency, a verified performance, and accountability. We want to be as transparent as possible to all of our partners and our clients around the world of what we've been doing, uh, what has been published about different solutions, what our clients and our partners around the world can doing, uh, are doing to also ensure a verifiable performance so that you can see if you're based in Bangladesh, you can read about the projects in Bangladesh. If you're based in Zambia, read about the projects and the science coming out of uh, Zambia. And also accountability for ourselves that if you look at uh, previous editions that we've published and you look at certain you know, performance indicators indicators uh, you know, of customer satisfaction that, that we uh, track with our clients or publications that have come out, also an accountability for ourselves as an organization, how we are, uh, how we are doing. And I wanted to, uh, first of all, I think also thank our team for uh, putting this together and everybody worked on it very uh, diligently. And also, especially all of our partners and clients that, you know, with uh, uh, their science or with their efforts on the ground have contributed to it. Um, I mainly want everybody to read it for themselves, but I did want to share a couple of highlights from it. If you can go to the next slide, please. So just a quick overview of what you'll find across uh, the report. We try to make it as you know, it's a, a very comprehensive. I think it's about 130 pages across uh, the book, but we try to organize it in such a way that you can also immediately grab and look at the aspects that you're interested in. So there's a part of uh, our impact at a glance with a couple of numbers. There is um, more information about what we're doing, for example, case studies across different settings. Could be active TB case finding, but could be uh, for specific key and vulnerable populations. Could be in a prison screening or screening in mining populations, as uh, Dr. Richard Jones will talk about later. There's a lot about uh, policy, uh, new policy and scientific evaluation when it comes to X-ray uh, and AI. Also topics about, you know, what are we doing beyond uh, TB for other integrated health service delivery. Um, so there's a lot in there. And just to show you a couple of screenshots and next slide, please. I don't want to spend too much uh, on each slide so we can go to our speakers later. But just to give you an idea of what you'll find in here. So impact at a glance, just a couple of key performance indicators that we track on our side. Um, you know, people reach with our different solutions, countries we've implemented it in, uh, new solutions deployed for the year and also cumulatively overall. 
Um, you know, amount of X-rays powered by solar energy, uh, the speed of uh, solving technical inquiries of our clients, these type of topics. You can go to the next slide, please. So where we've made an impact, quick overview, I think, uh, especially last year, expanded into another lot of other uh, countries uh, that were uh, new implementations also for us, and also working with a lot of clients that we have had the opportunity to with to partner for a long time. You can see here the, the different countries where solutions were deployed, a couple of uh, hubs or dedicated partners that support a larger region, and also our own offices in uh, in light blue. Next slide, please. So I think this is one of the most important parts, and you'll find it basically throughout the annual impact report. A lot of the, the policy and scientific validation, whether it's on portable x-ray, whether it's on artificial intelligence, whether it's on the use of mobile clinics, and just to see what is how has that impacted. For example, like here it's shown uh, TB cases uh, uh, yields. How does that impact uh, economic effectiveness, like lowering cost per screen? You know, how does it relate to TB and HIV, TB and diabetes, pediatric TB, and that across a variety of different countries. So we keep a library basically tracking, you know, for certain keywords, let's say pediatric TB or for a specific region or a specific country, you know, what is being published about that. So that you'll see throughout the entire uh, report, you'll be able to see also quite quickly, you know, from your country, what is being implemented there and what is the, the scientific validation coming from there. Next slide, please. So a lot of project highlights also. So, you know, the part of the scientific validation, but also the implementation experience. So there's a couple of regional spotlights in there, like here, for example, in Middle East. We've done a lot of work with Middle East Response Initiative with IOM uh, in the past years, delivering across numerous uh, countries simultaneously, like Jordan, Lebanon, Iraq, and Syria. So talking a little bit more in depth about how those do, uh, what has been delivered, how do those kind of projects work? So that's on a regional level, but also if you go to the the next slide, please. In a lot of similar cases, also specific country spotlights. So, for example, Nigeria, we've had the uh, the opportunity to partner with a lot of organizations there already for the longer term, like with the KNCV and also with IHVN. So, talking both on okay, what is actually being uh, deployed, um, you know, who is working with this on the ground, uh, what are the studies showing coming from the country. Uh, you know, of the, the, the results that they're actually gaining. Again, coming back to, we want to be as transparent uh, and verifiable as possible. So we've really tried to grasp all of that information uh, together in a way that, you know, you can quickly get the ma major insights throughout uh, the report. Next slide, please. So different voices of our partners, uh, also largely coming from the webinar series across 2023. So we've had the opportunity to have a lot of great speakers like the ones that we have today, sharing experience from their studies, uh, from their implementations. So some of those are highlighted also across the report. Next slide, please. Uh, apart, you know, people that we've trained like in the field, like uh, over a thousand health professional, 2023, 34 countries and how that those trainings were rated by the people that participated in the training part about service and support, like customer satisfaction and so on. So really try to put it on, you know, different performance indicator to make this as measurable and accountable also as possible. Next slide, please. So a lot of, uh, like I mentioned, specific, for example, zooming in on, you know, what's being done on active TB case finding, like here in Bangladesh, but there's numerous countries, but also other vulnerable populations like uh, screening among prisons, among uh, mines related to uh, the combination of TB, HIV, uh, and so on. So you'll see that across the report as well. Next slide, please. And I think one of our uh, one of my personal favorites, actually, what we've done on the area of community engagement, a lot of this is through our Dell Foundation. So we have a small foundation where we focus not on healthcare, which is the sphere that, of course, we're specialized in and that we're active in as an organization, but focusing on education and gender equality. Uh, where we have several projects that we did across 2023, like in Ethiopia and also in Ghana with our own coding club, working with different schools to make kids enthusiastic about coding and programming and what they how they could potentially uh, learn more in that field. But also training biomedical engineers in Ghana across a project that we did supporting GIZ uh, from Germany in the DEVELOP program. So more community engagement you'll find in there as well. Next slide, please. 
Yeah, so it's uh, available, of course, digitally uh, on our website. We have a number of prints actually available. Actually, I have one also uh, here on my desk uh, still. Uh, I wanted to ask the team. I think we'll send it in a follow-up after the webinar, but maybe the team can already send the link in the chat so that you guys can have a brief look. And on the next slide, I put also a QR uh, uh, code, but I think the link in the chat, and you'll get an email later with a copy of it. I think that's the the easiest uh, the way to 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 view it. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, maybe a quick outlook for 2024. Um, you know, coming back from 2023, what we've seen, and I think what we'll continue to see is that uh, an enhanced focus again on portable X-ray and CAT for TB. There's numerous sessions being organized, like for example in uh, the Philippines, a workshop organized by Stop TB and others. I think it's March 11 until 14th. If you're uh, there, please let us know. We'll have some team members going there. Uh, I'll be in China also this week, also later this weekend, talking about portable X-ray and CAT. So. I think across 2024, we'll be hearing a lot more about portable X-ray and CAT, uh, CAT solutions. So at the same time, of course, there's still a lot of work being done on their COVID-19 uh, response mechanism with deployments of mobile X-ray and stationary. So we expect that we'll have see more of that as well. Um, um, expansion of new clients and new partnerships that work with portable x-ray for the first time, but as well as at the same time, more infrastructural projects. So especially like in 2023, we have a number of those like in Mozambique implementing 54 portable x-rays with AI at the same time. So that's really more on the infrastructural side, but at the same time working, you know, with new partners and new countries where for the first time with one or two um, portable x-ray and cats, they're, uh, they're starting off. So Continuation, also various means of capacity building. So we've been enhancing and improving our e-learning uh, courses. We have multiple refresher trainings every uh, year that people can attend. I think expanding on this webinar series, it's, I think it's quite useful. And they are actually all available on our website. So all of the previous ones, I think there's about, I don't know, a library of 30 different uh, videos of different speakers from all over the world talking about portable x-ray, talking about AI, talking about the utility, utilization of mobile clinics. So a lot of different expectations you can, uh, or um uh, settings you can see all of those online as well and uh yeah from our side the reason we do the impact report in the first place is to uh, continue to strive for that transparency and impact accountability and verifiable performance which is also one of the reasons and i put it here on the bottom right you can go on our website click on uh, our global presence and see literally everything we've implemented in all of the countries that we're active in real tb screening projects specifically because that's our specialization so if you're from wherever in the world you're from if you see any of the countries with certain deployments don't hesitate just to send us a message and we'd be be happy to to tell you uh, more about it then on to the next slide um i have the uh opportunity actually to introduce uh, Dr. Richard Jones as our next uh, speaker, Regional Medical Director at International SOS. Dr. Richard, last time I think our seminar was in person in Indonesia. Thank you for making the time to also participate in uh, this webinar uh, online today. Um, and uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, Lauren, thank you very much. Um, and thank you for the invitation. Um, I um, I perhaps should start by by just making it clear that I'm I'm certainly not a, a TB expert and that my my participation here today is is perhaps more to uh, to uh, tell you a bit of a story of, of how we um, you know have worked in a in an environment where you know, TB is is perhaps um, best described as um, as as one of those neglected diseases. A uh, hugely important disease, but uh, but very often uh, the spotlight tend to be um, elsewhere. And so, emerging from uh, you know COVID, uh, we had an opportunity to reimagine how we um, did our um, our respiratory screening more broadly uh, in the mining industry. And um, and specifically for TB, and so uh, this is where we started our journey with um, with the uh, CAD for TB. So so very quickly going to um, you know perhaps walk you through what um, what our journey looked like. Uh, maybe next slide, please. Um, so I, I I plan to share these slides. So I'm not going to 
to pause on what we do as an organization. Some of you may know International SOS. We are we are truly a global company, and I shan't bore you with the stats, but it's all in there. And you know, I'd be happy to share these slides. So next uh, slide, please. Um, and then the next one. Um, just in the interest of time, right? So. Um, TB, as, as I think we all know, hence our participation here today, um, it, it is definitely one of those diseases that um, I think most uh, most governments and uh, you know and certainly in the in the in the high sort of burden areas, and this is part of my my remit. So I look after Southeast Asia, which includes India, it includes the Philippines, and it includes Indonesia, where I think the the majority of the burden uh, would fall. Um, we we um, we've had the um, the the idea to sit with our, our our mining clients and begin to map out what some of these challenges um, that the mining industry face would look like. I'm just going to highlight a few of these. The idea um, that COVID brought very sharply to focus is that uh, respiratory diseases love density. You know, and the mining industry um, is certainly an industry where you find a lot of that. So it's in accommodation, it's in shared transport, it's in shared, um, you know, under or overground uh, work environments. Um, but it's also the idea that very often um, employees would, um, you know, have the opportunity to spend a month or six weeks on site and then demobilize for a field break back to their families. And so, you know, it, it further complicated the picture that we looked at where we very often had um, uh, to, to, you know, live with the idea that diseases would be brought to the mine and the mine, you know, whatever diseases you acquire on the mine would then be um, equally, uh, you know, uh, brought back home. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just on the on the previous slides before, so sorry, I need to go back just to say that you know, obviously working on um, uh, on on remote sites where I think when when uh, resources were deposited, um, you know somehow they they they, they seem to all be deposited in remote or ultra remote environments, and of course as as mining um, industries developed uh, because of the 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 investment and because of uh, the opportunities, uh, communities just you know, naturally um, started to to appear uh, uh, around these mining communities, which then further complicated the uh, the picture because it's not something uh, dealing with uh, communicable uh, diseases and, and very often non-communicable diseases for that matter. It's not something you can look at in isolation inside the fence. You know, uh, very often um, you'd have to, to also imagine how you when you address some of these challenges specifically tb and, and some of the um, other uh, uh, neglected diseases vector borne perhaps how you could also address those communities outside um, of the mind um, immediate footprint just to show you what the burden in indonesia looks like um you know i i shan't pause at this uh, next slide please um you know just to show you that the distribution by age for us again is you know classic mining industry where you know, we have the, uh, uh, you know, the, the silver tsunami, uh, where the majority of the workforce tend to be people in their in their fourth and fifth decades of life, very, very similar to, to perhaps some of what we see in the oil and gas industry. And so there you can see the distribution classically in, in Indonesia, right across our, uh, you know, our, our sort of mining work age is where we see the, uh, the majority of cases in Indonesia. Next slide, please. Um, and again, just to underscore and to make the point that um, you know that the the uh, the drug sensitivity uh, again, you know, when we look at um, at the different distributions, um, you know, also for the resistance um, for workers, it is it is quite uh, clearly, um, you know, when we put all this together, it was quite clear that you know we needed a comprehensive strategy to begin to address um, TB, the burden of TB in the workplace in Indonesia, specifically in the mining industry. Um, and this resonated, thankfully, with the government of Indonesia's own initiative, which um, is a sort of fairly, uh, fairly aggressive initiative to look at eradicating you know, TB um, more broadly, but perhaps specifically in the, in the work environment by 2030. Now, I mean, obviously, as you, as, as we all know, you, you couldn't begin to eradicate something like TB unless you're able to to find 
TB and you know exactly what Florian said there. Um, it sounds to me like everybody's come a long way to uh, you know to closing that gap in, in you know actively uh, finding TB. Um, and then, of course, dealing with um, some of the related challenges. So next slide, please. So, so for us, um, and, and I thought I'd, I'd quickly walk you through what we what we put together as as sort of our um, you know our, our base case, if you will, or, or our sort of very um, you know basic model of approach to to uh, uh, beginning to address the TV more broadly in the mining industry. And, and as always, it's about awareness. It's about you know educating you know miners, but also the uh, the companies about what the challenges are. You know, just to, just to try and frame the conversation and you know, show them some of what I what I mentioned earlier. You know, the for example the the rotational challenges that we would face, and and the idea that you know TV um, is is not on everybody's um, agenda. You know, when when it's uh, influenza season. And we see influenza-like illnesses, and you go see the doctor with your with your uh, chronic uh, annoying cough. Uh, unfortunately, you know it, you know the problem list may not include TB until it's until it's quite late. So it became very important, obviously, to to imagine early detection. Um, infection control measures um, goes without uh, really needing to be to be spoken to. A regular health screening. So so this is this is where we found an opportunity. Uh, certainly in the mining industry, very, very often um, uh, annual surveillance or, or, or checkups um, is mandated. And, and, and this, is, this is the opportunity we saw, not just in, in Indonesia, but perhaps more, more, more widely or enterprise-wide, is to, to think about how could we um, introduce those measures um, more consistently, you know, to show mining companies that, you know, they can absolutely be part of a solution without spending new money necessarily you know so they're already committed to doing the annual health checks so then it just becomes a matter of how can we better um, you know tool or weaponize that information that they're gathering to arrive at you know who needs to be screened where do we pause how do we deal with latent tb next slide please oh sorry can we move to the next slide oh there we go thanks um, so access to healthcare services uh, again, you know. Whoops, sorry. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, again, most mining um, environments would uh, would perhaps have a big tick in this box because you know mines very often would have to 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 plan their their own initial stabilization. You know, their own on site um, medical. Um, sometimes it's it's uh, it's very basic for uh, for for just stabilization. You know, a triage before patients are moved on. But very often, actually, you find that 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 all the wherewithal, you know, the resources to do a proper investigation would be uh, would be available on on mine site. So it then became a matter of, as as I said earlier, you know, just how how to train, how to capture um, the skill sets, uh, make it so that it's it's uh, replicable and it's scalable, so that you can easily transport this, you know, also in terms of language um, and, and in terms of of, of culture and and sensitivity. Um, employee support and engagement uh, it goes without um, without saying that you know where um, unions um, uh, etc uh, may be part of the landscape hugely important to to make this um, you know a kind of initiative where where the the benefit not just to the company so the return on investment to the company must be you know must be central to this whole conversation obviously I always find that 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 is what uh, you know creates open doors to be pushed is when uh, companies understand what the return on investment is, you know, the, the cut down on absenteeism, you know, more productivity, uh, cut down on healthcare costs, obviously. But equally for employees, I think, um, you know, this engagement and, and dealing with the, the stigma that's very often, um, uh, you know, part and parcel of, um, you know, TB, perhaps HIV as well, or, or both way, where this coexists, to deal with that up front to make sure that um, that employees understand that the, uh, you know, the support and the resources are there um, if, if they are found to be TB. Collaboration with stakeholders, um, well, I shan't dwell on that. Please, next slide. Quickly want to get to some of the, the data. Social determinants, um, you know, uh, as as I said, you know, this is very much um, an area that I think needs to be addressed uh, very, very um, actively, especially when it comes to um, 
you know some of the areas outside of of, of the immediate mining environments uh, you know, this is where um, you know investment um, very often the social csr programs can look at stunting can look at malnutrition can look more broadly at uh, building capacity in the communities you know monitoring evaluation um again you know part of what we normally do you know what you what we measure we manage i think that's i think that's everybody's mantra around um, around diseases and then of course research and innovation so for us this is where we we had the opportunity to pause and look at and, and we're very thankful to find uh, CAD for TB because it really changed, um, you know, our our perspective. And my my only the only uh, the only comment I would make around this is that unfortunately not every GP is an expert at reading X rays. You know, so so yes, we have GPs, yes, we have X rays, yes, we have patients with TB. But if you put them all together, uh, it's it's not always a given that the outcome will be the one that you want. So so by by giving this um, this extra um, uh, support. Um, it, it, it just helps a lot. So not every every image needs to be transferred. Next slide, please. So what what we've seen in our um, in this case study um, is, and you can see for yourself. So there are good reasons why we've seen these ebbs and flows. You know, um, we, we've had um, we've been monitoring TB in this workforce, um, and the workforce is um, is thirty thousand strong. It's a pretty static workforce. It's a it's a, it's a very impressive mine site. Um, and, and you can see how uh, the, the the top line is the town, this uh, this commercial um, you know imperative that will arise outside mine sites, as I as I described earlier, you know, and it's grown over time. And and as it's grown, of course, TB as as one of the burdens, um, you know, uh, now uh, unfortunately seems to diverge from what we are able to do at a job site. Um, you know, obviously you can see that we had our challenges uh, around COVID where we were we were chasing disease, but we were chasing different diseases, and and uh, and, and that definitely came back um, uh, as a bit of a as a bit of a challenge post COVID. I'm happy to report that we're back on track. I think you see in the next slides. Um, just really quick. Um, no, sorry, move to the next slide, please. Yeah, go on. Next slide. Sorry. Yep. Next slide, please. So yeah, so so you can see this is this is essentially just a really quick, um, uh, you know, stab at, at at the burden that we've faced across our thirty thousand employees. You know, we'll put this alongside four and a half thousand malaria cases. Uh, we've had our hands full, um, brand new dengue cases, maybe ten to twelve a week. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to uh, to show you what um, what what our um, uh, detection looks like um, okay fine this is self-explanatory um, uh, next slide please uh, so so this is this is what I what I mentioned earlier so the latent TB this is one of the um, areas that CAD for TB certainly helped us in you know also it helps that in the country in Indonesia latent TB has, has become a, a, a clearly defined um, area for um, for treatment. You know, the government would sponsor the treatment as long as we can stratify, identify and then stratify those individuals who have latent TB um, into individuals of high risk. And, and so this is an area that we've been working on and again, using the CAD for TB. So let me just use the next slide to show you what our, what our numbers look like. Um, sorry, next one, go on, there you go. So, uh, so this is what we've done uh, over uh, the year of 2023 um, with our CID for TB. And, um, you know, what is of interest to me is that the, the cases that we would probably not have detected, you know, uh, we, we, we've been working hard with our, with our doctors um, to make sure that we improve their ability to, to have an index of suspicion, because as you know, TB and silicosis uh, very often would be you know, present as as as, um, uh, as as challenges together. So whenever we we have an index of suspicion, you know, from uh, from exposure groups, etc., um, we would we would help our GPs to better prepare to look at X-rays. But what the CID for TB has shown us is, um, and you can see, it's not just the high CAD scores on the on on, on the um, uh, um, uh, um, uh, on, on the graphs. That uh, that we've that's helped us to find active TB, but um, so we had uh, 22 of the uh, asymptomatic um, cases, which probably would have ended up 
um, as cases that would have gone to the barracks and, you know, 22 um, uh, cases which would have caused, you know, goodness knows how many other persons to be, um, you know, infected. Uh, next slide, please. So, so we've recently added um, uh, the, the CID for silicosis, and we're working closely with, uh, with Delft to, to now help us interpret, um, you know, where to set our, where to set our threshold for, um, in terms of our index of suspicion, you know, because escalating these cases, especially in a, in a, in a mining environment, has a certain, you know, uh, occupational impact and, and, uh, and potential consequence. So um, I apologize, it's a lot of information. I wanted to share just this this really quick journey with you. And I'm going to stop here and uh, and just thank Delft for, um, for 12 months of, um, of of some real difference that this has made, um, you know, to us in, in, in our environment. And I'm, you know, as I, as I have the, the, the honor to look after a, a, a rather large um, you know patch with lots of mines on it one of my priorities in 2024 is now to take this take this technology um, you know to the other mines as well and sort of leapfrog a lot of the challenges that I that I spent uh, an awful lot of time you know just banging my head against uh, you know against the wall not, not really getting anywhere so so I, I'm not there yet but I, I do think I know how to get there so thanks very much everybody I'll stop right there thank you Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. We are happy to assist you in what, in how, however way we can. Uh, moving on, now we have uh, we have Dr. Yaw Adusi Poku, the Program Manager from the National TB Control at Ghana Health Service. He will talk about accelerating TB case findings, screenings in key population art centers and TPT in Ghana. Welcome, Dr. Adusi Poku. Thank you very much, Kachi, and thank you, everybody. I want to say, and I'm very happy to say that Ghana was a pioneer in the um, Delft imaging and cut for, for TB use. And this has gone a long way to help Ghana. So please, next slide. I, it's, it's about using the digital X-ray and cut for TB in vulnerable groups. One of them I want to say is they are the ART centers. So how did we begin? Ghana began the TB preventive therapy policy introduction late, um, but with the introduction of the digital X-ray, uh, we were better equipped to introduce TPT, and I will show you with results. Please, next slide. Right, so we had the better capacity to exclude active TB, and so we decided to introduce the TPT at programmatic level. So in 2021, we developed our TPT guidelines, which we adapted from WHO, and then we piloted this in 10 regional hospitals in 2020 before scale up at the national level. This was a collaboration between the Ghana Health Service, Arum Institute, who provided with the medicines, WHO Ghana Country Office, and the West African Net Regional Network of Tuberculosis Scientists. Of course, using the Delft Digital X-ray with CAD. Please, next slide. So the policy highlights were this, that one, we will incorporate our standard approach, uh, operating procedures. We will incorporate digital x-rays as well as symptom screening too. We will also have legibility criteria. We will have treatment options. At that time, we started with isoniazid and then we, we tailed it off and then introduce through HP. We also monitor adherence, adverse events, and treatment completion. Next slide, please. Right, so on my left is our algorithm. Okay, we have algorithm for facility-based, and there's one also for the ART, and then contact tracing. On my right is the symptom screening tool, 
that we have. The next slide, please. Okay, so following the, the pilot study, we were going to scale up in 16 regions in 261 districts, beginning from facilities. Le next slide. Right, so we use our digital x-rays with CAT, and I must say that it came handy. There were some trainings for GPs, general practitioners, on how to marry x-rays with the history and also taking samples for testing, spitting samples for testing. Please, next slide. Okay. So the aim was that of the pilot at that time was to do systematic screening of TB among patients living with HIV. We have the containerized. We also have the, later on, we got the Delft light at the back that we put at our back and go to the communities. We also have the, the housed one. So the second aim was to conduct the feasibility of initiating of PLHIV without active TB on TB preventive therapy. Please, next slide. Right, so um, the first speaker mentioned those who were asymptomatic. For us, the TB yield was 2%, and those asymptomatic, just using X-ray alone, was 26%. OK. And then we have the clinically diagnosed 72% and bacteriologically confirmed 28%. Of course, we the WHO, uh, we, we, we don't need x-rays to, 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 uh, as a place for introducing TB preventive therapy. But this is the result staring at us, which means that with the introduction of digital x-ray, it goes a long way to help the country. Please, next slide. So we scale up this in 2020 to include contact of TB patients. We had to build capacity at that time virtually because of the COVID, the impact of COVID. And then we introduced the three HP alongside the isonize it. And then we fully in transit from isonize it to 3HP. Next slide. Right. So if you come to the new HIV clients, you see the results, which we are trying to improve on it. But this is the results staring at us. Next slide, please. And then we come to the TPT enrollment among contacts. Contacts. Uh, HIV contacts, okay. And so here we are also indicating that the contact enrolled on TPT was 43.48% with a new HIV client on TPT. Okay, that goes for um, 30%. We are trying to improve on it, but it, 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 it's, it's kind of put this in context over there. Please go on. So we had challenges. One of the challenges is that we have 71 digital x-rays compared to 261 districts. Okay, we also have challenges with data capture. And then, so from there, we have placed these digital x-rays in high volume sites. However, uh, we have a strategy. Next slide, please. So the strategy in 2024, next slide, please, is to introduce the concept of hotspots. What do I mean by the concept of hotspots? The digital x-rays are not everywhere with CAD. If you take Ashanti region, for instance, Ashanti region has slums, also has prisons, the second largest prisons, also ha has mining communities. They have hard to reach areas. We are working with NGOs. We have what you call the government side community health planning and services. We have mapped all this. What we will do is to move our digital x-rays and advance into this Ashanti region 
we make sure at the facility level, we register all those who need x-rays, contact investigations, we register them, which means that we have to have very good address system. And then we also visit the prisons and screen them. Mining areas we screen, both with the digital x-ray and the symptom screening, and then we come out. This is the concept of hotspot screening, targeted hotspot screening, using epidemiology to guide us in terms of the communities with high number of cases coming, what is the community population, and then we, we derive proportions. Next slide, please. Right, so we will use the hotspot concept as I've indicated. We will build capacity for our health staff and then we will improve on our reporting using our e tracker. Next slide, please. Right. I just want to, on behalf of those who are benefited from our x rays, our symptom screening, and our x rays, and this is what they want to thank you for. You never know your impact until you see the smile of it far away. And the second point is, what is that we are missing in life if those in need cannot access our services? That's why we need some innovations to get our digital x-rays down, down to those who need it. Next slide. I want to thank the Royal Dutch on behalf of the Director General of Ghana Health Service, the Minister of Health of Ghana Health Service. I want to thank, thank the Royal Dutch government for providing us together with the Ghana government, these digital x-rays. Also the WHO country office, the Global Fund, the USID, the Orum Institute, Ghana Health Service, Minister of Health Ghana, and the West African Regional Network of Tuberculosis Patient. I want to thank them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yodusi Poku. You rightly uh, pointed out, I don't think anyone could have said it better. There is no better impact than seeing the smiles that are touched by your solutions and by your fight against TB. Um, moving on, I'd like to invite Dr. Alex Scott. He is a research medical officer at the Center of Lung Infection and Immunity at the University of Cape Town Lung Institute. Today, he will be discussing optimizing expert-oriented active TB case finding for TB with digital radiography and CAD. Dr. Scott, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, and to Delft, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present um, at this forum. Um, I just wanted to put my camera on and say a uh, warm welcome to everyone, and so that we could uh, see uh, uh, each other uh, face to face. Um, next slide, please. As uh, has been described, um, although we've made strides, um, as noted in the WHO Global TB report in 2023, um, there are still um, a major gaps um, in the number of individuals that are diagnosed or reported. Um, if you click next, please. So of the 10.6 million people that are estimated to have fallen ill with TB, there's still one in three. Um, that is an extremely large number of 3.1 million people globally. And, and if we are to find uh, these patients uh, will need optimum screening and diagnostic strategies and tools um, if we're going to uh, implement strategies to, to end TB. Uh, next slide, please. And one aspect of um, our strategies uh, to try and end TB is to take diagnostics out of the clinic and to put it into the community. And this is um, by finding what we call the missing millions um, as well as those who are probably infectious um, and, and driving community-based TB transmission. And this is even more pertinent when one considers that um, almost half of all TB um, in this setting um, is, is subclinical. Um, and for those that are, are, are unsure on, on the term, subclinical TB is, is TB that is microbiologically proven um, or positive, um, but participants are asymptomatic. Of course, subclinical TB is a, is a very important topic at the moment, um, and I don't think there's one definitive definition at this point. 
um, with very much um, with variance on what considers uh, symptoms. Is it specifically symptoms related to uh, the WHA four symptoms screening? Um, or does other symptoms like shortness of breath or fatigue should they also fall into into TB uh, symptoms? So I think it's an important uh, topic, uh, maybe a, a separate presentation on itself, just on, on subclinical TB. Um, but again, it, it makes it uh, crucial for us to find uh, the subclinical TB um, individuals um, if we're ever going to, to, to curb community-based transmission. Uh, next slide, please. And so what we've done at our unit at the, at the Center for Lung Infection and Immunity um, with many collaborators um, is, is to draft uh, and develop a, a model uh, which we have noted as, as expert orientated active case finding for TB or the exact model. Um, and this has been coming on for uh, over a decade um, where we've tried to establish this active case finding strategy um, by taking diagnost screening and diagnostics into the community in an active case finding strategy. And so the first study uh, was conducted in uh, 2011 to 2015, which is known as the exact one study, uh, where we just wanted to prove the concept. Um, and we established or, or conducted a randomized control trial uh, where we fitted a um, point of care uh, battery operated exact uh, uh, um, expert uh, system um, into a truck with a generator. And you can see we screened um, almost 5,000 people in South Africa and Zimbabwe and found this to be a very um, important strategy where we detected almost 10% of TB um, in those with symptoms or, or HIV. Um, and the study we, we published in, in the Lancet Infectious Diseases. Now, uh, if you can click next. We then took the model further um, and we wanted to demonstrate the efficacy of this scalable model of a uh, portable and uh, mobile expert system where we could go into the into these um, high burden communities. Um, and in the exact two study, um, <clears throat> which was uh, conducted in 2016 to 2020 and, and recently published um, in Nature Medicine, uh, we found it uh, that screening over 5,000 people, actually we increased our detection rate. Um, and importantly, expert itself detected almost all probably infectious TB. Um, I'll come back to probably infectious TB because again, just like subclinical TB, it, it um, you know, on one concrete definition of what infectious TB uh, constitutes. Um, I'll come back to that and we can click next. And a ongoing study, the exact three study um, has now uh, tried to validate um, the feasibility and, and the impact of this validated um, exact model. And this is a study um, which is now coming to the tail end. Um, as you can see, um, we, we rapidly screened almost 17,000 people um, in four sub-Saharan African countries. Um, and, and this will be an important uh, study uh, to, to show that this model is both feasible and has a major impact um, in detecting TB and, and likely probably infectious TB. Uh, we can go uh, next slide, please. So we know that there have been rapid advancements um, in radiological uh, TB screening. Um, and it has evolved from, from the old analog system um, to computed systems to now digital systems. Um, However, even through these advancements, there are still some drawbacks. Uh, we know that there's expertise and infrastructure required um, and inter and intra reader variability, uh, not to mention the, the radiation exposure um, that, that needs to be uh, considered um, when implementing this in, in any um, active case finding strategy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, but we're very excited, and I think the whole community is, is excited in that the, the advancement of radiological technologies have gone so far and so quickly um, that we have ultra portable chest x ray systems and now, as we know, AI driven computer aided detection. Um, very briefly, I know this is a Delft webinar, but just for, for everyone, we know that CAD is an AI-driven system um, that's based on, on deep learning neural networks that interpret abnormalities on chest X-rays. And these abnormalities um, are noted as either suggestive of TB or not, uh, usually expressed as, a, as an abnormality score in the case of, of uh, CAD for TB, a zero to 100. 
um, and that is deemed positive or negative if it's above or below a pre-calibrated threshold. Um, so although chest x-rays are, are extremely uh, sensitive, um, and this has been shown in, in decades of work, we still require confirmation or microbiological testing to confirm the TB diagnosis. And that's unfortunately due to its low specificity, especially in a country like South Africa, um, where levels of, of history of previous TB is very high. Um, it also adds further uh, complexity when you, when you have a, a very high HIV uh, or TB burden as well, uh, where HIV can have atypical uh, radiological features. Um, and so this, this begs further questions. Um, we know that expert in this setting, in this community-based setting, is an imper uh, imperfect diagnostic. Um, in, our, in our exact two study, we showed expert sensitivity of around 50% in culture positive uh, TB. Um, and furthermore, there, there are individuals with a chest X-ray suggest of TB, but have negative microbiology. Um, again, there's lots of modeling work, uh, transmission modeling work to show that um, th there's a subset of patients that, are, that fall into this group where the chest X-ray is suggestive of TB, have a negative expert and or culture, um, but months or, or years down the line uh, will develop uh, active symptomatic TB. So how do we incorporate these important aspects into clinical practice and uh, policy decision making? Um, there are other uh, additive questions as well. Uh, what role does computer aided detection, um, how does it fit into uh, an active case finding strategy? For example, our exact model. Is it feasible? Is it cost effective? Um, uh, next slide, please. And next. And so we conducted firstly um, a, a systematic review um, to try and find out what the diagnostic accuracy of CAD is in pulmonary TB in Africa. Uh, it, there have been um, uh, multiple publications and it has been established that CAD is, is, uh, uh, has very high accuracy, but most of these have been done in passive case finding, which uh, in other words, uh, individuals who attend healthcare facilities, uh, which is a very different population um, populational characteristics of, of, of a community-based uh, setting um, where we believe uh, a large amount of transmission occurs. Um, and so, uh, next slide, please. And so we found that um, in our uh, systematic review that, that it, it almost met um, WHO uh, target product profile, uh, which um, is a sensitivity of 90 and specificity of 70. Um, however, of all the studies, there was a large uh, or a high level of, of, of bias um, and applicability concerns. And, and the most important one, which I think has been uh, spoken about or spoken to for, for, for a number of, of uh, years now, is such large prevalence surveys or active case finding strategies um, to mitigate cost, to mitigate resources, unfortunately, uh, are not able to microbiologically test everybody. Um, and so usually what would happen is you would only test those that have symptoms um, or those that are, uh, are shown to have an abnormal chest X-ray, either by a human reader or by um, a CAD analysis. Uh, next slide, please. And so our main project now um, moving forward is, is Exact 19. Um, and I just want to spend a few minutes on uh, uh, describing our study and our project that is currently ongoing. Um, Next slide, please. This is a, a busy slide. Uh, this is our study overview. Uh, I just wanted to very briefly show you on the, um, the aims and, and aspects of the study that we want to include. We've incorporated a randomized control trial um, that will determine the utility of CAD as a triage tool uh, to, to optimize this exact model. Um, you can see in the slide where uh, Again, going into three sub-Saharan African countries uh, in, a, in an active case finding, community-based active case finding um, setting, um, rapidly screening a large number of, of patients uh, to include high-risk individuals. Um, and we believe that high-risk individuals are not just symptomatic or HIV. Uh, there have been data coming out of other risk factors for TB, including, of course, contacts, uh, diabetes, history of previous TB, so we're including these, these patients as well into this uh, randomized control trial. We also wanted to look at how does CAD 
uh, what's the value of CAD uh, in, in screening um, healthy individuals, individuals with no risk factors at all. Um, and that is something that we will be looking into as well. And of course, um, we were predominantly speaking on TB at the moment, but we did have a, a, a COVID-19 aspect since the, the trial started and was um, subject to multiple delays, as I'm sure other projects were due to, due to, the, to the pandemic. Uh, but we're also focusing on how um, other tools such as CAD for COVID um, can, can impact this, this active case finding strategy. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly focusing on the on the RCT, um, again, I, I mentioned the, the different groups or high risk groups that we believe are an important uh, group of individuals to, to screen um, and to truly understand uh, the impact that CAD can have um, on these uh, individuals in, in, in these low uh, resource, high burden uh, communities. And so we randomized participants or eligible participants into either two arms. Arm one would be CAD plus expert. And, and very similarly to previous studies, we're doing um, an expert um, uh, as, the, as the confirmatory diagnostic um, if those uh, individuals are CAD positive, um, compared to just experting uh, the individual. And we want to see um, how does CAD-based triage when when used in tandem with expert, we want to see, does it have an improved TB yield? Is it feasible? And is it more cost effective um, compared to an expert alone strategy? And we predict that CAD would pre-select a group of participants who are more likely to have active TB um, through confirmatory testing and thus increase TB yield um, in addition to reducing the need for, for um, expert testing. Um, our, our primary outcome for this study um, is time to detection. Um, and although we chose this, this primary outcome as um, point of care expert, although specific has suboptimal sensitivity in this setting um, as, as described. Um, and thus the addition of care to this algorithm will not only improve sensitivity, uh, but assist in targeting and reduce costly resource requirements. Um, to a smaller, scalable, and more manageable group of participants um, who are more likely to have um, TB. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, our brief setup. Um, this is uh, our setup in, in one of our sites in, in, um, in Zambia on the left. Um, and on the right, uh, this is done in, in Cape Town as well. As you can see, we're using the um, Delft um, Ultra, uh, which is ultra, port ultra portable expert system. Um, we're able to set up pretty much in, in, in any uh, location um, with the, the detector attached and uh, securely uh, attached. And then you can see in the background on the left with the CAD uh, laptop and, and CAD analysis running. Of course, everything is battery operated. We conduct everything offline, uh, which makes it much easier to, to target the individuals um, in the community um, that are likely... Uh, transmitting disease um, and are part of that missing millions um, uh, in, in, in the community. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly, I just wanted to show you a couple of case studies um, on how this can impact um, uh, the, the community and individuals at large. Here's a 37-year-old male. He is completely asymptomatic. Uh, he has a history of previous TB, but he's HIV negative. His initial expert negative, and he is also smear negative. Uh, next slide, please. You can see this is his chest X-ray, uh, reported as normal by the human reader. Next, please. And his CAD for TB um, analysis uh, shows a score of 21.72. Next, please. His culture after four to six weeks comes back as positive. Um, and in the South African site, um, one of our uh, aims is to also conduct uh, PET-CTs um, to better understand the sensitivity of CAD um, and its discriminatory value uh, when compared to a more sensitive tool like PET-CT. So if you can go next slide. So this individual, although normal appearing X-ray with a relatively low score, um, was culture positive and showed on the CT uh, to have thin walled cavities um, as shown on, on, on the slide. You can go on to the next uh, slide, please. So again, a 35 year old female, asymptomatic, now no history of, of TB, HIV negative, a, a relatively healthy individual. Her um, expert came back positive, is very low, and the smear was negative. Uh, slide, please. 
Again, here you can see the chest X-ray, and this time it was noted as probable active TB by the human reader. Next slide. You can see that the CAD for TB score was much higher, as you can see on the heat map with the, the CAD for TB analysis showing um, abnormalities suggestive of TB. Uh, next slide. Her culture came back positive as well, and you can uh, next slide. Once again, you can see multiple apical cavitating nodules bilaterally and a thick walled cavity uh, in the left lower lobe. So these two cases are examples of relatively asymptomatic, healthy individuals um, that are examples of probably infectious TB, as we know that cavitary disease um, is, is a proxy for infectiousness, um, who had likely not attended healthcare facilities and were only detected through community-based active case findings, such as our, our exact. Um, strategy. Um, this is this is uh, really important, not just for the community, for policymakers, but also for the individuals um, who would and their families who would be in the community uh, transmitting disease, um, potentially transmitting disease uh, without uh, ever being diagnosed or reported. Uh, next slide, please. Of course, there are challenges in implementing such a study um, and such a project. Uh, the first, of course, are regulatory approvals. Um, this is one of the first studies to include an ultra portable X-ray system in, in, in our country, in South Africa, um, obtaining approval for, for novel and screening, uh, novel screening and diagnostic devices are often, often onerous and challenging. Um, but I think the benefits always outweigh um, the, the administrative work to try and get these uh, devices approved and used um, firstly in, in a research capacity, but with the goal to implement it um, uh, uh, pragmatically. Uh, next slide. We also have patient-related challenges. Of course, this is a vulnerable population. These are uh, low-resource communities, high levels of poverty, and in South Africa, a very high burden of, of HIV. And these uh, diseases are, although strides have been made, are still stigmatized um, to individuals. Um, and these are important considerations to have. We also have a uh, uh, concerns or difficulties in, in follow-ups and treatment uptake. Again, I think this is a uh, for, for another presentation where we could discuss this at length um, with re relating to the patient-related challenges of, of, of the community and the setting. Um, detecting these patients is one thing, but how do you ensure that they are uh, referred for treatment, that treatment is being initiated, that treatment is being carried out um, over over months. Um, and then next slide. And then of course there are um, technical aspects of well as well. Of course, training needs to be conducted um, at a project like this. Um, training has to occur at all sites. Um, there is radiation exposure. However, we have seen studies show that ultra portable X-ray units have very low levels of radiation. However, it is important to still consider this. Um, for example, another a practical aspect would be to have uh, pregnancy testing conducted uh, um, before any X-ray is taken for for any females. I mean, these are important things that might go uh, seem intuitive, but but when actually doing it on the ground um, needs quite a bit of thought. The X-ray system itself, uh, we have one of the older generation um, uh, Delft Ultras. Um, I know Delft has done fantastic work um, in in uh, advancing the the Ultra. Uh, to having fewer cables, the charging system, the offline connections, the CAD uh, uh, connectivity. Um, and we look forward to, to working with Delft on, on, on of the new technological advancements as well. And then finally, we've also found an, uh, with, the, with the early versions of the Ultra to have limited um, kilo voltage, which, which um, in our setting where we also have uh, larger BMI patients, uh, very tall patients, uh, it sometimes causes errors, um, which we perhaps might be due to BMI, the environment of some sort. Of course, this is this is something that we're looking into. We've been in discussion with with Delft as well, um, and 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 it's very important information, um, not as in research, but also for 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 the company um, to have these these things highlighted um, so that it can be addressed for 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 future uh, use. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, uh, I just want to go through some of the strengths of our project, um, which, of course, uh, is something that are very important to us, is that we're contributing important and novel data on the pragmatic use 
um, of ultra-portable x-rays, as well as CAD um, during this very important community-based active case finding strategy. Uh, next slide. We are uh, aiming and plan to detect not just active TB, but also subclinical TB, as well as probably infectious TB, uh, which is uh, quite high uh, in, in the community. Next slide. Uh, and the next slide as well. And what's very important is, is not just working with the patients, uh, working with um, institutions, but it's also working with uh, individuals on the ground, not just the patients, but those that live around and with those patients. So we engage uh, quite a, a lot with our community leaders, our community advisory boards, which, which provide invaluable insight um, and assistance in, in, in locating either these hotspots uh, uh, of, of TB, but also in, in locating, for example, family members, household contacts, um, uh, difficult to reach areas. Um, so it's very important uh, to, to have this knowledge as well. And then finally, providing vital information to, to screening strategies and national TB programs uh, to improve policy and practice. And next slide, please. Uh, and we can click twice again. So there's still a major gap in the global TB burden. We know that there are one in three that are not diagnosed or reported. Um, however, there have been major advances in radiological screening with both ultra-portable X-ray and CAD. And we believe by optimizing active case finding strategies, for example, our exact model using these tools, um, it, it may be a key strategy to detecting TB and interrupting uh, community-based TB transmission. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, of course, this is not, uh, this is always a team effort. Um, I, I'm the site PI for the South African site, but we have the uh, other sites uh, in Zambia, Professor Helen Ailes from Zambard and Dr. Junior Matvangwa from the uh, BRTI in Zimbabwe, and then our global PI, which is uh, Professor Kirtan Deda, um, who oversees the entire project. Um, of course, all the research teams, the partners and collaborators, our participants, um, and this uh, funder of uh, EDCP, EDCTP2 uh, program, uh, which of course, none of this would be possible without the funding and support of them. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, uh, and I'll be happy to take questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Scott. It was very insightful. Uh, just a quick reminder to everyone before I introduce the next speaker. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A panel so that our team and panelists can not only answer you right away, but also take it up in the end at the Q&A session. Now, moving on. Next slide, please. Last but not the least, I would like to invite, uh, invite Professor Rodney Elric, uh, also from the University of Cape Town. He is the senior research scholar at the in the Division of Occupational Medicine School of Public Health. And today he's going to be talking about overcoming obstacles in implementing computer-aided detection for silicosis and TB. Please welcome Professor Rodney Eldrick. Thank you very much for inviting me. Good day, everybody. Um, those three presentations are very fine background and introduction to what I'm going to be talking about. Next slide, please. So um, the silicosis, uh, CAD for silicosis is much less developed and the obstacles at an early phase of development, um, but you can see that many of the challenges are very similar to those facing uh, the use of CAD for TB alone. Let's go on, next slide, please. So uh, we don't know how many silicosis cases are in the world because it's very poorly recorded and diagnosed, but we know the extremely high prevalences in some mining areas, Southern Africa probably leads the way, but China, India, Brazil, uh, Indonesia, um, and of course, surveillance becomes more difficult, the, the, the sort of the less developed the country. Um, these happen to coincide in most cases uh, with high TB burden countries. So really, when you're talking about silicosis and CAD for silicosis in a screening context, you're also talking about tuberculosis. So in Southern Africa, our mind has been focused for, for some years now because of the need to x-ray large numbers of miners and particularly gold miners because uh, silica exposure is highest, the risk is highest in gold mining, silicosis being a fibrotic disease of the lungs. Um, the litigation uh, led by attorneys um, has resulted in a number of awards and settlements which require the finding and examination of large numbers of miners who have worked on the South African gold mines, but many of them are not in South Africa, they're in Mozambique, 
Eswatini, Lesotho, uh, and Botswana, and some countries further north from the old days. But the South African mines themselves, uh, the gold mining industry has shrunk to about 90,000, but uh, X-ray screening is in fact done in all the mines, and there's still about 400,000 working miners. So the question is, where is CID, and this is the primary question, I suppose, from the commercial aspect, but also from the public health aspect and investment by WHO in our interest and the funders and funds, who are the potential users? So we've heard about today on today's presentation, mining companies doing medical surveillance, um, compensation agencies. So South Africa has quite a well-developed but poorly functioning, I say well-developed, I mean, on statute books, poorly functioning compensation system. So the question there is finding people who are eligible. The uh, class action suits or the, the, the litigation has resulted in uh, trusts, which are civil agencies or private agencies, which have the same mandate. And the latest is the, um, the uh, Chamiso Trust, which uh, the award was 12 billion rands, about $330 million, to find all the miners who have worked between um, for the, the uh, defending companies for over the past 50 years, examine them and see the eligibility. Um, there are and there have been dedicated centers for miners and ex-miners within the health services, usually functioning very poorly for reasons we don't go into now. But there is development in surrounding countries. And then TB programs, which is this is an area of development because of the investment in TB programs, are now adding um, the examination of miners as part of their screening. Next slide, please. So let's talk about opticals. First of all, silicosis, we're talking about on the chest X-ray now, can be a very difficult diagnosis. Compared to autopsy, and we know this because South Africa has an autopsy system for miners and has done about 100,000 autopsies since the uh, 70s on, on miners. Only about two thirds, sorry, only one third of silicosis shows up on the chest X-ray. Secondly, the, when we talk about silicosis, the, the number of radiological phenotypes, that's the observable representations of, of silicosis vary. There is nodular and the CAD I'm going to talk about is mainly, mainly directed at identifying nodular disease, but there's also massive disease that, um, that's localized or asymmetrical uh, conglomerate masses on the chest X-ray and also part of other pneumoconiosis. So co-workers pneumoconiosis uh, for example, is a combination of silicosis and COPD, all due to dust in coal mines and various other mixtures called mixed dust nucleosis. So there is a range of phenotypes. This, of course, makes CAD development more difficult. When it comes to diagnosing as opposed to observing a nodular pattern, this is again the problem facing CAD developers. In South Africa, the main differential for nodular pattern would be tuberculosis, but there are many other causes non-infectious sarcoidosis, cancer, uh, other infectious diseases, fungal infection, other infections, making the differential diagnosis a local matter for which local expertise is needed. Silicosis is much more sensitive. When I say sensitive, I mean sensitive to, to, to being missed or misdiagnosed with poor quality chest x-rays. Now, this was particularly a problem with analog films, um, and it should be disappearing with digital radiology but it seems not necessarily to be the case. And the reason is when you have a symmetrical nodular pattern of nodules in the X-ray, it can be very difficult to distinguish from normal bronchovascular markings. This is not the case, for example, if you have a mass in one lung or you have a pleural effusion. Sharp contrast is needed. And also you need to read these X-rays on a high standard monitor screen uh, otherwise, you're going to make mistakes. And, you know, in, in the, obviously in remote settings, uh, this becomes a big issue. And CAD, uh, hopefully, can overcome this problem. And silicosis frequently occurs in combination with TB. We use the word silicotuberculosis. I'll define it later because it hasn't had one definition. And often with COPD as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so just to give you some visuals here. So what's the initial, the basic problem? Can we distinguish silicosis from normal? If you have a nice normal fixed in your mind and you have advanced silicosis with high contrast, there's no problem. And the medical students would get this right or they would see that it's clearly is nodulation. But that's not usually the problem. Next slide, please. So now we have to distinguish silicosis on its own. And the silicosis from tuberculosis. Now, on your left is a international labor organization standard film, which is distributed for people to use to calibrate their eye. Now, that is a difficult film. 
uh, or difficult image, should I say. It's a digital image. Uh, you may be, you're probably reaching forward to your monitors now. You probably can see that there are nodules, but maybe not. Could it be TB? So the beginning of the problem should be dawning on you. Now, the other picture doesn't look very different on the right. This is an 18-year-old boy who has never worked in with silica, and he has tuberculosis. Um, the arrows point to uh, cavities, which uh, start to uh, swing the pendulum towards infectious disease, but there are in fact, uh, there is in fact a nodular background. Next slide, please. Distinguishing silicosis from silico tuberculosis is also a problem facing um, readers in, in, um, in settings in which uh, both are common. The slide on the, the picture on the left, in the left lung, you can see there are nodules in a particular pattern called the bat's wing or angel wing, and that's typical of, uh, of silicosis. In the right, there's another disease, which and being in the right up low with loss of volume, et cetera, is almost certainly tuberculosis, but is it active or is it old tuberculosis? This is not a problem. This is not something you can infer from this um, from the X-ray. So silico tuberculosis we use to cover both active and inactive disease. The other x-ray is extremely difficult. We can see lots of nodules, large nodules of different size. There seems to be an air fluid level, possibly the filling of a cavity. Maybe there's a fungal infection in there. There's pleural thickening. Now you can, um, so, so this is a problem facing readers and it's a problem facing CAD. And finally, of the pictures, next slide, please. Silicosis can present as huge masses. Um, the one on the right, that's your right, our right, is a very unusual picture. There's not much that looks like that. There's absolute masses which are symmetrical. But when you get asymmetrical masses, it could really be many things, uh, cancer, TB, and a few others. Next slide, please. The other problem with um, silicosis, there's no gold standard. Unlike TB, there's no high accuracy. Well, gold standard would have been a high accuracy reference standard that we've heard about, other than autopsy. So CT could play an important role here, and there's no question that CT is more sensitive in picking up silicosis, but it also identifies specific features, and we've seen this in the, the previous uh, presentation, not seen at all on the chest x-ray. This includes adenopathy and bronchiectasis particularly, and surprisingly, I found this very surprising, massive. So I've seen a clear chest x-ray, not clear chest, uh, chest x-ray with just nodules, and the CT showed a mass in the right upper lobe, which was simply not visible. Um, CT can also show different distributions, which are used to, now you need a specialist a reader radiologist to make uh, this determination, the distribution of the nodules um, can also give you clues. Now you're getting down sophisticated uh, radiology, but generally CT is not available, certainly not for routine use in the settings in which I'm talking about. Reference standard relies on expert readers. The point I want to make, it needs to be a reader with local experience. And that could be a radiologist, occupational medicine physician, medical officers, but irrespective, irrespective of how well trained they are, all readers, expert readers differ in their readings and that seems to be irreducible. Next slide, please. Um, this is just a demonstration of how we analyze. Um, the, uh, these are two readers being compared uh, using the DELF system. This was now 2022 paper and uh, it's the uh, receiver operating characteristic curve shows high accuracy and approximation of the readers. Um, when you look at the actual numbers, you'll see that they're both highly sensitive if we fix the sensitivity above 90% and um, with moderate sense uh, specificity. So the readers can get quite close. But when you, this, that of course depends on context and the reading set. Next slide, please. The use case for silicosis, unlike the very persuasive and, and, and impactful use case in hearing that, is not as clear. So many people have who hear about AI uh, have misconceptions about it. So they believe it's going to replace the silicosis, and particularly in a compensation environment, do better than the doctors in finding my silicosis. This is not the case. So the, the chest X-ray and therefore CAD is used for screening or triage. In other words, people of which the, there's no prior prob uh, high increased probability, uh, pre-probability and triage for where there is some uh, pre-probability. Diagnosis or adjudication still requires some sort of confirmatory uh, system. Secondly, TB is a treatable disease, as we've heard. Silicosis is not a treatable disease uh, requiring subsequent confirmation. So what, what, what is the purpose of screening? Well, one can think of a few. In workers still exposed to silica, 
The question arises, which is uh, political, industrial relations, uh, and socioeconomic questions, removal from exposure, or, which is also an economic question, intensification of protection, which has very much been lacking on the, in gold mining over 100 years. It's improved recently. Now, for those no longer exposed, now we're talking about the hundreds of thousands of ex-miners, really compensation, if relevant. In those who have silicosis, coming back to TPT, uh, they should be included as a they are included as a vulnerable group, requiring screening for availability for uh, preventive treatment, in which case active TB in the settings and the pictures that I've shown you has to be excluded. Um, the impact of silico tuberculosis on experts is not on silicose in modifying expert results um, has not, that's not been particularly studied. And the management of combined disease. Now we have two diseases. We have progressive uh, fibrotic disease and we have tuberculosis as a post, uh, with all its post-TB manifestations. We have active tuberculosis. We've just heard about subclinical tuberculosis and there's latent tuberculosis. It's a complex public health and programmatic problem. And the choice of threshold depends on the use case. Next slide, please. Vendor performances vary, um, and there are a number of vendors for TB. And one, as a user, as a buyer, we need to understand the source of the, we'd like to understand the source of the training images, the training protocol that was used, and the validation outcomes in different contexts. These need to be transparent. And we heard earlier on about the importance of transparency. And the unfortunate thing is for some details, I'm not an expert yet, somebody correct me, there's a potential clash between uh, transparency and proprietary needs of the vendor. A recent study in South Africa compared three different versions of CAD for TB, four, sorry, five, six, and seven, and found significant differences on the same data set compared to radiologists, sorry, the same X-ray set. Um, significant differences, particularly in sensitivity, and particularly with the last version, this has been published, and accordingly, the optimal threshold. So the threshold would have to be immediately reset. Next slide, please. So this is my last thing, my last slide. So what are the challenges the, we've heard about, and I'm sure it's happening, the software needs to improve, the, make distinctions, particularly given the phenotypic spread of tuberculosis and silico TB, question of incorporating masses, question of training. We need more clinical research, and particularly, I think, for silicosis, something to match the article by Kahn, 2017, Computer-aided reading of tuberculosis, chest radiography, moving the research agenda towards informed policy in which they set out a type of um, study design and uh, um, everything to do with study and ethics. In other words, a sort of practical guide or set of criteria by which clinical validation studies uh, should be judged. The problem of threshold shifts and needs an algorithm for the local users. It's a question the user needs to ask, what threshold should I use? Um, operations research, we heard from uh, my colleague, that that, um, that is needed. Now, that's not well funded. It seems that some funders' eyes glaze over when you use the word operations research. We're talking about everything that we've heard about today, side-by-side -side comparisons with actual doctors and radiographers on the ground, ease of use, connectivity, agreement with readers, but don't, I don't mean validation. I mean agreement with the doctors using it, because if the doctors and the clinical assistants, clinical radiographers, see things they don't agree with, they're going to lose faith in the CAD. And of course, the effect of outcomes and the efficiency of its compensation outcomes, management, fitness for work, or screening for TB in relation to cost. And we, we need to educate users who are dazzled by new technology. AI seems to be the source of the dazzlement. Um, we need to shift from a new, to simply a new technology to programmatic thinking, and we've heard plenty of examples of that today, from what does it do to how exactly can we use it? And I end off with a uh, next slide, please. Just publications from our particular group, but these slides will be available. If you want to follow those up. There are the literature is generally small, but there are other studies of silica or pneumoconiosis. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, uh, Professor Rodney, and thanks everybody uh, for uh, for joining the webinar today. We'll move over to the Q and A session. We're going a little bit over time, but rest assured, as always, and I think those of you who have have been in our webinars before, we always send send the Q and A sheet afterwards. So even if there are questions that we're not able to uh, tackle uh, live, uh, we'll be able to uh, to answer them and send them to you later on. 
There is a lot of uh, different questions that were raised. Thank you for that. I'm trying going to try to group some of them because a lot of them are in the same uh, area or category. I wanted to start with a couple ones that uh, I wanted to ask, especially to uh, to Dr. Alex, because uh, there were some questions for his presentation specifically. Um, uh, Dr. Alice, if we could ask you live, there was a question from uh, Cecily Miller. Uh, thank you for the presentation. In your studies, was CXR CAT only done on symptomatic uh, HIV plus individuals or was it done on everyone? Uh, thank you. Yes. So um, in the randomized control trial, in order for us to distinguish between uh, the CAD plus expert uh, use and expert only, um, the CAD uh, the ex uh, CAD was an analyzed in the field uh, for the CAD plus expert arm. In the expert only arm, it wasn't done in the field, but will be done at a later stage uh, blinded um, so that we don't uh, cross um, uh, during the randomized control trial. Ultimately, everyone would have an X-ray and everyone would have CAD. And in a sub-analysis, we'll look at how CAD works in both arms. Perfect. Thank you. And two brief questions uh, additionally for your presentation, if we can. There was one uh, from Asfabeza asking, was expert used for screening or diagnostic purposes in the exact studies? Yeah, so in the uh, in these studies we used uh, specifically for, for our study now is, is used as a diagnostic. Our reference standard would be expert and or sputum culture positivity. We also conduct sputum culture in all participants. Um, the, the reason we've used uh, expert um, is because it's a, it's a diagnostic uh, tool that can be used um, through battery operated systems. It can be done point of care. Um, and there's a lot of drawbacks with, with culture, even though it's more sensitive, there are drawbacks such as time, uh, expertise needed, um, lab requirements, all those things. Uh, but with expert, uh, a nurse uh, or a technician can do it um, after trained, uh, being trained. Uh, and, and, and it's definitely something that's scalable and can be done in, in a community-based setting. Perfect. Thank you. And one last one, if we can. Uh, there was a question which I think looks at the, the follow-up after CAT, which was what happens to those who are AI suggestive and expert slash culture negative cases? That's a very good question. Um, this uh, We have to just uh, differentiate between uh, the research aspect, the academic aspect, and then there's also patient safety aspect. Um, so now we know in this setting, um, expert is not perfect. We know in this setting that CAD is not very specific. Um, so who, which is right and which is wrong? Uh, it's a difficult question and you'll only know that afterwards. Um, but for the participant safety aspect, anyone who is CAD positive, but expert or culture negative is followed up. We follow up all our participants to look at their, as a clinical review. Um, it's also reviewed, the x-ray is also reviewed by a human reader. Um, and again, if they feel uh, intuitively that this patient requires further workup or referral to their uh, local clinic, uh, then we do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Then I'm going to group a couple that were asked uh, because I think they hint at the same uh, topic, which is also on the, the radiation exposure for uh, ultra portable x-ray. Now, firstly, maybe starting what we do on our side is so uh, all of the Delft light kits, for example, come with a lead apron still for the radiographer. There was a question here, what do you do with lead shielding? We've seen that question pop up in certain projects. I think with lead shielding, of course, you quickly lose the portability with the ultra portable x-ray um uh, there was a question also specifically on yeah, the, what is the radiation exposure really coming from these systems and what has been published about that um i think uh, as also leonie paulus also mentioned there is an independent team uh, working on this topic on radiation safety and they're at the point of submitting a paper uh, to an open access journal and uh, looking at the radiation safety of four different ultra portable systems amongst which the the delft light so we need to wait for that I think a little bit longer, but that is indeed in uh, the works. Um, and from, yeah, the, the, let me at least phrase it this way, that from what we've seen in practice, the radiation exposure, I think first results is fairly low. I think uh, um, uh, Dr. Alex also mentioned this in his presentation from, from what we have seen, but I think it will be great to see the, uh, the results coming from the independent team, as uh, Leonie also uh, mentioned. 
Um, there was a question also on you know what is the the best uh, portable X-ray or what specifications are needed. I think I wanted to highlight that Urban Law also mentioned guidance on the specifications for ultra portable X-ray systems from WHO and the Atomic Energy Councils. So I think that was a very good reference also to look at. Um, yeah, on, obviously from Delft side we have uh, different portable X-ray like the ones that were highlighted today. There are are a lot of uh, different ones on uh, the market. One thing I generically like to say is I think it's good to still um, see or still understand that uh, X-ray, uh, the type of X-ray you'd select, of course, also depends on your requirements and your objective on your setting. If you are looking to do, for example, 300 exposures, you know, in a larger clinical uh, setting in a larger hospital, you wouldn't pick a portable X-ray. It's not a, a solution that is going to work in every single uh, setting. Um, so there is a balance between portability, often also, of course, uh, the weight and exposures that you can take. So there is a balance to be found there, which we've highlighted and talked about, I think, also in previous webinar sessions, again, which are also on our on our website. So I think that's a good consideration also, like what are the objectives of your program? What kind of uh, system fits best for that? Um uh, and there are also the what I lastly what I wanted to mention there is quite a lot uh, actually published uh, on this or different guides uh, stop TB I think is a great guide also on portable X-ray and CAT uh, which talks about this topic quite extensively so I could also recommend uh, that question from Leonie Paulus also on is there data published on uh, trading and validation of CAT solutions with ultra portable images yeah CAT for TB has been trained with images from ultra portable uh, uh, um, systems, but this hasn't been published about uh, separately. There's two more questions that uh, there's a lot of them. Again, we'll talk about them. We'll make sure that everybody receives the Q&A sheet. Two ones that I wanted to talk about specifically. There was a question um, from uh, Deus in the chat uh, saying that, you know, programs are excited to have this uh, evidence of the availability of X-rays and CAT. Challenge remains the very high cost on procurement uh, and warranty makes scale up difficult. Is there a plan uh, of revising the costs lower as countries procure more machines for scaling up? Um, I think generally, I think it's good to look at that. A lot of the systems, of course, even though they're portable, they are used for a variety of applications beyond also just to be often we see the same systems being used for fractures and beyond, which makes the utility quite extensively. And I think it's also good to recognize that these systems can be used for a very long time, provided they're properly maintained, not just through a warranty contract, but also by the users themselves, which I think over time uh, being able to use, we have some of these systems that were deployed already in 2018, being used, for example, for some of the first ones in, uh, I think, Paraguay, Eritrea, and Uganda that are still being utilized, so five years uh, plus, which, of course, then the, 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 the usability over a longer period of time also decreases the total cost of ownership that you inquire. Um, but also shortly, um, uh, there are, with most procurement uh, mechanisms, uh, to put it generically, the costs are lower uh, with higher quantities. There are volume discounts applicable, so the costs become lower as countries are scaling up uh, in larger uh, amounts. And we are continuously looking also together with our suppliers and other partners, how can we bring the costs down? How can we make this uh, the system simpler? Or do we need all of certain accessories that are normally requested with it to see how we can bring that down further? Lastly, I think it was a very good question about, you know, ultra portable x-ray. They're, of course, mostly used in remote uh, areas. How do you support with, you know, if there are technical concerns on the ground in such cases, which I thought was quite a good question. I think generally we see, of course, they are ultra portable x-ray are intended to be used in remote areas. Although quite often uh, we do, of course, see them in more um, and less remote and a slightly higher resource uh, settings being used as well in different clinics using both for passive case finding and active case finding. Um, what we see, at least how we approach it from our side, is that we do a lot of effort in the capacity building, not just when the project starts for the people who are using it, but also with refresher trainings. We talked about it briefly at the beginning with at least three per year. Also, these are like our webinar 
available in five languages in parallel so that even when people move uh, between uh, different teams or they leave the NTP, for example, move and new people join, that new capacity is continuously being uh, built. So our first goal is always to make sure that the people that are using the uh, systems can tackle most of the technical increase. If they can't, uh, we always have in every country that we're active in, we have local partners on the ground that can support if and when needed. And also our own uh, team can help with that. So we have a ticketing system where people can uh, make a ticket quite easily and they'll be helped remotely. And we see, especially when it comes to issues related, for example, CAT or technical ones, that uh, the far, far majority of those can be tackled very easily and quite, quite quickly remotely uh, as well. So that's how we, we approach it. I've already gone over almost 10 minutes uh, over time, so I wanted to end it here. I wanted to, again, thank the uh, speakers for uh, attending today and for uh, sharing their experiences. That is very much appreciated. I think we've seen that, you know, the, the challenges that different programs encounter, uh, different projects encounter across the world are very varied. And I think sharing these experiences with a larger group gives new ideas and new inspiration and new learnings also to others who attended. So that's very much appreciated. Thank you, everybody who attended the webinar also uh, today. Uh, and again, we will share, everybody will receive the recording for those who registered, and you will also receive the Q&A uh, sheet with all of the questions that were asked. So I wish everybody a very good day, and uh, thank you again for joining. Bye.